Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 710, that's 710, that's 710 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing good. Wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. Yes, I can complain, that's the whole point of this podcast, so I'm just saying that at the beginning to be put myself in a good mood but of course I'm going to complain because why else would I have a pod where I ramble to myself into a microphone to a audience of hundreds and thousands and millions if I wasn't just going to complain right who wants to sit here and hear me praise things 24 7 nobody so of course I'm going to complain you know I'm going to complain because this is the number one cultural complaint podcast in the world so thank you for joining me thank you for joining me first on my docket for complaints and something that's just fresh off my thinking because i just finished watching it over the weekend in like four increments i recently got through to watching mission impossible dead reckoning part one mainly because it's available now on most of these sites that i try and watch things at if you know you know but i did plan to watch this movie in a cinema that was the main plan the main plan was to watch mission impossible dead record in part one in the cinema i did actually have a plan of making sure that i bought my ticket you know i had a bit of a joint before i left i got myself some popcorn had myself some m ms and went to go watch out my local cinema that was actually the whole flipping plan and you know what i'm glad i didn't i'm glad i didn't watch this movie in the flipping cinema because oh my god how utterly terrible now, I'm not too sure if this is terrible because I'm advancing in age and I'm just not into these type of movies anymore or if Mission Impossible has fallen off ever since I started watching it, the franchise. But I'm, I have a feeling it's probably the latter. Most likely over, over time, something has happened. Maybe the good writers all disappeared. Who knows? Maybe Tom Cruise might have had them offed based on his whole Scientology thing. I'm not really too sure. I'm just throwing things out there. But there's definitely something missing with this mission impossible nowadays compared to the one i used to watch before or compared to the ones of yesteryears it was absolutely trash and the fact that it says dead reckon in part one that there's a part two due or maybe a three and a four and a five is really filling me with dread because i can't put myself through another two hours of this absolute boring mess one absolute horrendous 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 movie like honestly so utterly bad so utterly pointless like the main sort of prop the main sort of like villain he's facing in this movie again spoiler alert but most likely you're never going to watch this so spoiler alert if you are listening and you want to watch mission impossible dead reckoning the latest mission impossible please make sure you skip ahead but for those of you that don't care the main villain in this movie is what a sentient ai a sentient ai is the main villain of this movie it makes it sound oh it's sort of got this like weird um almost um rattly dolphiny type of sound that it makes as it's in the as, as it's in the computer like moving around and shit and it kind of projects itself onto walls and onto people's watches and shit it's on this guy's face mask because it's in a box like utterly bizarre one of the worst villain tropes i've seen in my entire life absolutely horrible i hated it from start to finish and i knew something was off when i saw i saw i think in the in the airport one of tom cruise's um, characters ethan um co-conspirators this woman that keeps kind of you know um this kind of pickpocket lady uh she they kind of have it this kind of having this back and forth thing throughout the entire movie that drives me crazy anyway she could never quite trust him all the way until the fucking bitter end it's really annoying but there's a bit where they first meet each other in an airport and it kind of zooms into her bag and i think if i'm not mistaken the logo on her bag is like coach or something i think i remember the logo it's like a saddle bag a little short bag she has on she, she's wearing and it sort of like zooms in way too close to the bag and it feels like a big product placement like an advertisement and i knew from then on oh this is going to be bad this is the first few minutes of the show of the movie itself I was like oh no this is going to be really really bad because some of these movies always have a you know a really crazy product placement there like a flip out nokia thing or like a bmw thing but it's done really it's done not so it's done you know it's not done as a kind of placeholder it's done in terms of like adding to the plot point whereas this was just a let's just zoom into this lady's bag as she puts this key inside there that everybody wants inside this really beautiful designer bag it's just like come on bro come on man 
come on. And then the whole car scene with, you know, Tom Cruise's character and the lady with the handcuffs and she can't drive, but they can't say it aloud and say that she's bad because she's a woman driver, because that would obviously be lending to the negative tropes about women. So it's kind of implied, but then it's not because she's terrible. And then he gets behind the wall and he's really good. He's just like, oh, and then some of the, it, the some of the CGI they use on that car scene on the little narrow streets around Italy are just, I don't know, man. I don't know. The movie was garbage. But then I look at the box office and I see that it just about broke even. It made allegedly around three five hundred and sixty five hundred sixty seven point five million dollars. So maybe I'm in the minority. Maybe I'm in the minority of people that watched that and didn't and didn't think it was terrible. Because most people did and they liked it. So fair play to them. But it does go to show you just how difficult it is for us customers for us reviewers, for us regular civilians to decide which movie to watch in the cinema. Because I think with this sort of franchise, with Tom Cruise being the actor that he is, and with what they've done in the past, you should be safe in the knowledge that if you spend £20, £30 to go pay to watch Miss Impossible in the cinema, you should be okay with the knowledge of thinking you can trust these guys. Because they've given you, you know, a decent amount of Mission Impossibles beforehand that have been worth the money to watch in cinemas. But nowadays, because movies and because the writing and because the talent level in Hollywood is so fucking crazily low, you really can't take anything for granted. You have to really be careful about how you decide to spend your money, if you care that way. If you have the money to throw it around and spend how you want to, fair enough. But I feel like I've been robbed sometimes when I spend money and I watch movies because most movies nowadays are fucking garbage, which is why a lot of us probably torrent rip stuff or watch only the stuff available on streaming sites and shit because the movie just doesn't make it worthwhile because the price is too crazy um and yeah this really disappointed me the entire time that i watched it and i was really glad i didn't end up making an effort to go watch this in cinema even though i'm sure the cinema experience would have maybe added to it it might have maybe changed my mind slightly i'm glad i didn't because i would have definitely left that cinema spitting absolute feathers if i had to watch that for flipping you know with having to pay my hard-earned money to watch that crap i would have been so furious so if you're into mission impossible stuff fair enough give it a try um the other thing i thought was really distracting and i couldn't get my to keep my eyes off it was how weird tom cruise looks like the work he got done on his face unfortunately just hasn't sat right with his face um maybe it comes up differently in in you know for other people based on how you view things but once you see the difference of what he looked like prior and you notice the things that he's changed in his face and whatnot it's just kind of sad to see you know somebody just not being okay with growing old because i still think he's a pretty decent looking dude i don't think he would have looked that bad if he just would have accepted the fact that he's an older dude and just kind of went with it instead of trying to hold on to his youth and try to make himself look younger than he did and i just ends up looking i don't know weird you know just end up looking weird on screen it's hard to say and to put into words but when you see it you can't unsee it really you just keep looking at his face and it's strange and um yeah performance was pretty terrible from him also um every, no, there's no i don't think there's one character in this movie that's redeemable honestly they all annoy you at certain points they're all kind of insufferable obnoxious um and just up their own ass and shit just i can't do it i can't do it anymore and i'm glad i'm kind of over it and yeah i will not be watching dead reckoning part two unless it's available on all those flipping streaming sites again because i can't do this to myself i really really cannot honestly i really can't do it to myself um talking about getting work done over the weekend, there was a pretty interesting debate that I saw on social media regarding the one and only Kylie Jenner and regarding her impressive appearance at Paris Fashion Week because it feels like we're watching this in real time. She's slowly but surely changing her aesthetic and the things that she's kind of aligning herself next to. Some people would say she's kind of you know reverting back to her Caucasian factory settings, but I think most likely it's just a shift, right? You kind of have to keep reinventing yourself when you're a public personality like she is, especially if you're an influencer, especially if you're a beauty influencer, fashion influencer. You just have to constantly keep um, reinventing yourself and this is just one part of the reinvention you know she's got the new boyfriend um she's got this new look so fair play to her but it really did make me wonder and question or it maybe it reminded me of this question i always used to pose whenever i'd go to clubs i'd go to clubs and i'd be out yeah having a good time usually on my own and trying to make friends being the loser that i am and i'd be going in a smoking area pretending to smoke flipping menthol cigarettes and i'd kind of strike up conversations with random groups of girls and random groups of guys but mostly it'd be with the girls i'll be like hey 
I'll throw out a little conversation star and I'll be like, oh, do you think if you had all the money in the world and all the time in the world that you could look as hot as Rihanna? And that'll be my usual kind of way to go around it. Um, and that kind of question to kind of, you know, be a bit of a conversation starter, start a bit of debate, get people laughing and just to kind of break the ice a little bit. Over time, I stopped doing it because I felt like it sometimes would come I, unintentionally or come across a bit mean. And also, you know, just leave people alone. It's just not, you know, some people are just out there trying to get a breather, trying to fucking roll up, trying to make sure they, they you know, they haven't lost their pills and some of their gear. And here I am. Guys, what do you think about men and women? You know what I mean? It's just like, it's annoying. So I get it. So over time, I just stopped asking that question. But it was really interesting and really instructive or illuminating because it did really, to me, show the differences between men and women. I feel like by and large, women do have a little bit more of a, um, a little bit more of a tendency to be delusional and I feel like it's a good thing right I think women tend to be delusional is kind of self-protective in some way shape or form but it, you would never get a better example of a woman's delusion if you just ask them that question do you think you could be as attractive as the hottest woman in the world with just money and time and most women would say yes they just think all it takes is money to get the you know the the job the work done that you need to get done in your body um the money needed to pay a trainer and the time it needs to get fit and work out and lose the weight and stuff and obviously not having a full time job and be able to commit your entire life to just like get looking amazing most women legitimately think that they can do it which is it to me insane but you know what everyone's got their things but one thing that really struck me when i was thinking about it was when i saw this picture or this video of kylie jenner um, enjoying herself and having a gay old time over there in Paris I thought to myself like do women really think that all it takes is money and time to look like this like do they honestly think all it fucking takes is money and time because I don't think so because I think over the years we've seen Kylie be mocked online for having a like someone says here in the comments an old face but I think we are finally starting to see her face maybe settle in, if that's a thing. I'm not sure if it is a thing in plastic surgery. Maybe it isn't. I'm not too sure. I'm not too plugged into the cosmetic surgery world. But I feel like her face is starting to match her body and her look overall way more than it did before. And that isn't, I don't think, by accident. Definitely something has happened intentionally behind the scenes that's allowed her to be a little bit more to look a little bit more congruent in how she appears and whatnot. So clearly there is a constant everyday dedication to ensuring that she looks the best that she can look. And I don't think that is just a money and time thing. I think it's a I think it's a personality thing. I think it's a um, determination thing, willpower thing, whatever it may be. It's not just money and time because I think for any of us who've tried to do the whole social media influencer thing online for any of us that has friends who always takes pictures of meals when you're out or to wants to have their picture taken when they're on the train when they're sitting down when they're walking you know how annoying it can be to be that friend yourself and to also have friends like that so just imagine trying to make that your job trying to make your job to look good online and offline 24 7 a day 24 7 uh, um you know 24 7 365 days it's not easy so I think people really, um, under, people kind of, um, what do you think called? People downplay how difficult it is to actually be these people full time. It's not as easy as they think. And I also think there's just a matter of, you know, good genetics as a base and then the ability to also stop because there could have been a easy many times in Kylie's journey and maybe people say even now that she could have probably gone a bit overboard and done a bit too much. But I feel like over time, somebody has definitely pushed the let's just relax button let's not go too far because now you're finally starting to see her look i think her best overall um outside of maybe some of her like streetwear type of era i think she definitely looks the best she's ever looked now and i think as well that's just a talent in itself to kind of be like even though i've got all the money in the world all the access to all the best people in the world i'm gonna stop and not do too much because i can get a bit crazy um and it's just insane to see and to hear people legitimately say they could do the same thing with money and time because it's just assuming that it's kind of in in a way it's sort of like um an arrogance to it because it basically assumes that we're all born on the same level of attractiveness and no matter what how ugly you look you can make yourself look like a quote-unquote you know conventional 10 if you just had the money and the time which is nuts because if that's the case then why are 10s born you know <laughs> what's the point of having a 10 if you can just make yourself into a 10 10 should not exist it shouldn't be a thing anymore but whatever it is what it is but one of the best things i did like about it was this um crazy meme to come out of it which i'm sure will be all over the place soon but it's just hilarious to hear her her voice you know <laughs> like this to be said i love this okay let's 
Let's go, family. It's showtime. It's fucking showtime. <laughs> Personally, I just love it. I think it's fucking impressive. I love the delusion that most women have regarding their looks and how they can improve it over time because the fact that there aren't many Kylie Jenners around kind of speaks to how hard it is to look that way. Um, but I do like the idea that everybody legitimately does believe that if they just had enough money and time um, to, you know, to do all the things that these guys do, that they could look as good as these guys look, which is, you know, is maybe more of a reflection on the current state of cosmetic surgery that is at a level now where legitimately everyone believes they're not ugly, they're just broke, which is a nice thing to come for yourself with but the reality of it is most of us are just ugly it's okay to be you know ugly and to just make the use of that and make the best of it but i also think that maybe partly explains why i've always thought men's beauty could never be a thing because i think you know fundamentally especially straight men they don't necessarily care about being beautiful they just want to look the best that they can look so take a straight guy that's maybe ugly. He might just want to be in the best shape he can possibly look. He might do the whole looks maxing thing, which is basically just trying to make the best that you can with what you have available. Losing weight, sorting out your teeth, sorting out your personal style, your hairstyle, your personal hygiene, and just trying to push your base to the top as you can and without doing cosmetic surgery. And that's what most men are really comfortable with doing, which is obviously not what beauty is now. This beauty is everything cosmetic surgery makeup the whole shebang but rarely if ever does beauty really enlist or encourage women to kind of go out and run 5ks every day and whatever you know what i mean it's mostly just about you know getting work done covering up whatever things that you you know you don't like about yourself and accentuating the things that you do like about yourself with little tricks and whatever it may be and little tools that's why i thought you know men's beauty could never really take off too far that way because men just want a base level that they can work with and then the rest they can kind of you know um fill in the gaps with money clout fame you know all this sort of stuff prestige power bloody blah 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 so maybe that's where it sort of gets a bit different but um it's been quite cool to see her out there as well doing a thing but one of the other thing that's been really interesting to see and i think to me is the biggest example as to why most regular people have an issue with nepotism and it mostly isn't because we don't you know believe that if you are successful in your field that you shouldn't give the opportunity to your kids to have the same level of success or access to your opportunity, things that you did it's just more so the unfairness of allowing people who maybe don't have a talent for what they do an opportunity to do things that they would never be able to do if they weren't the person that they are and there's no bigger example of that than kendall jenner walking some of these paris fashion week shows because kendall by on paper is a very attractive woman right she's very desirably very desirable looking um she's clearly um you know somebody that i think most men will be into clearly someone that most women won't look like and she's clearly somebody that you could say would look like a conventional model but once you put her amongst actual models who do this as a job or once you think about some of the legendary models that have come before her and you see her walking on the runway the first thing that you think about or the first thing that comes to know or to mind is just how ordinary she looks when she's walking right there's a video of her walking at Straparelli, and you're just like god almighty like you can't even walk in a straight line there's a better video of this i don't have at the moment it's just her turning around there's a video of her walking um on that catwalk and she legitimately can't walk in a straight line and the funny thing about this particular cat with Straparelli is it's more so done in a hood couture slow catwalk type of way mostly like a lounge i forgot what the actual name behind it was but the whole idea behind it was to have it like a slow presentation around amongst in front of sorry some very chosen select the vip people in the audience and less so of a glitzy big fashion runway thing so you can actually take your time more with the walk you can add a bit more personality to it it's a bit more um dare i say there's a bit more emotion to it it's just there's a little bit more artistry to it you could just show off a bit and do make it your own and even in this particular platform she's doing absolutely nothing and as the common trope is on social media she's absolutely serving absolutely nothing and the thing for me that's the main really startling thing about this is just that this is basically the issue most of us have with nepotism it's the fact that the opportunities to walk on the runway like this are usually reserved for the best models out at the moment right and 
for her, she's just been able to leapfrog certain steps because of her name, because of her family name, because of her clout, her fame, her fucking social media, whatever it may be, which is not a bad thing. I think the bad thing or the annoying thing is just the insult to our intelligence from the people that are in those positions to say, no, but it wasn't handed to me. I did everything hard. I think there was one interview that she gave, which was like, oh, I purposely would take my name off on the list and change my name so people didn't know it was me coming. All this, It's just like, dude, okay congratulations for having some level of self-awareness is better than 90 percent of the people out there but the main issue mostly is that a majority of these positions or some of the big positions out there some of the big opportunities get taken up by people who effectively get born on third base that's a really unfair cruel um, realities of life that most people especially in the arts especially in entertainment um, the only way you can weather the storm you can afford to work hard you can afford to work for free is that you're basically born within some level of privilege that allows you to take those chances but if you have a quote-unquote passion for fashion and you just want to do it for the love you really can't yeah there's only so far you can take that without your belly rumbling and you needed to actually work for something and work to make some actual money so that's the only real problem i have with it it's just the fact that you get given these opportunities as nepotism baby and instead of making the best out of it and actually trying to use it as a springboard to you know take yourself to a new direction or to basically highlight how good you are what you do you just do the bare minimum and if anything you end up confirming everybody's fears of why nepotism is a bad thing in general because look at this walk out of victoria beckham like even i being a non-model knows when you're walking on a runway that sort of turn that she done where she basically turned her face before turning her body isn't what you're meant to do in one respect right you're meant to actually probably leave your face um looking at the cameras where she's basically facing looking at you for as long as possible before you turn your body and you make it look as dramatic as possible but this basically looks like somebody you know when someone doesn't know how to dance and they're counting the steps in their head as they're dancing and you can you can actually you, it's almost like you can see them counting the steps in their head this is basically what it feels like when she's walking you can feel her counting the steps and listening to the cues in her head as she's walking this victoria beckham show and it looks really really horrible unfortunately but you also understand why certain designers want her to walk their shows because she brings eyes to your show and it's kind of press that you probably could never pay for so that thing sort of like makes all the sense but then i like that the final presentation of her or during paris fashion week was during um what you call it during uh, the l'oreal show and this was basically the best version of her walk the best version that we saw because i think the memes were going around there she was a topic of discussion on fashion twitter for you know a number of hours and i'm sure that word maybe got back to her and she decided hey i'm gonna remind these guys about my power and just how good i am on a runway and we got this basically clip of her walking down the l'oreal runway um looking probably the best that she's looked you know doing the, doing a model's walk on a runway and it's still nothing you know it's still serving really nothing it's kind of average at best and again, just makes you realize that, you know, the life is basically rigged. Life is ultimately rigged and you just have to make the best of it with what you have, essentially. That is it, basically it. You can't sit here waiting for people to make things fair for you because life is rigged and people like this always get opportunities ahead of you because they're just born on third base. But then sometimes they have the fucking cheek. They have the cheek, right? They have the cheek to insult our intelligence and tell us, no, I wasn't born on third base. It was just as hard for me as it is for any other model on a runway. You know, I think to yourself, hold on, how could it be possible though when you're not good at your job? It's one thing getting an opportunity. I think I'm the same thing when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, affirmative action. It's one thing getting an opportunity based on your race or based on your gender, or your sexuality. That's a bit gross and a bit weird and a bit reductive, but fair enough, you got your opportunity. But once you get it, show out and prove prove to people that you belong to be there that you didn't just get it because of your race gender or your fucking sexuality at least show up and prove but most people i feel like don't only want an equality of opportunity they also want an equality of fucking outcomes they want to be just as successful as these supermodels that came before them without doing the necessary work but then they also want the same chances that those guys got and it's just like come on bro you're already born on third base you already got everything handed to you on the silver plate can you just work for something 
can you just take some time off during your hectic schedule to work on your run to work on your fucking walk you've got all the time in the world you don't work a regular job you don't have responsibilities of having your own family you've got plenty of free time that you could legitimately dedicate to pouring over archive footage learning how to walk watching some documentary speaking to some of these guys and girls understanding their point of view at the time that they're doing blah, blah, blah. you could do all the work you need to do and then pop out looking like an absolute superstar on the runway but no let me just do the bare minimum and get away with that. And then when people complain, I'll start crying about mental health. It's absolutely crazy, man. But hey, what can you do? Life isn't fair. And it kind of is what it is. It kind of is what it is. Moving on from that one, I quickly want to touch upon the Tremaine Emery interview, courtesy of the Torre show. Big up Torre for sitting down and basically um, doing the interview in the first place. Um, I think it was good that Tremaine sat down with somebody who he probably respects, somebody he felt like would give him a fair shot because he didn't come into the interview with his backup. He was a bit more open and forthright and was willing to kind of be a bit introspective, was willing to kind of answer some of the criticisms that he was getting uh, based on his decision to leave Supreme, the reasons behind it and some of the weird positions that he was taking on it. But one thing that was very clear to me, having watched the interview with Tremaine on the Torre show, was I feel like fundamentally, it really wasn't that big of a deal. I think at the time, it was blown out of proportion a little bit. Maybe I played a part in it with some of my reactionary videos and clips and stuff. Who knows? But I think by and large, there was a difference of opinions, objectives, expectations when it came to the job, which is unfortunate. And I feel like there was a real breakdown in communication very early on. Um, I feel like he definitely came into a job expecting it to be one thing. And then when he went in, there it was a different thing. And also the culture didn't match. And I just think being seeing that he was an independent contractor, an independent entrepreneur, creative artist for the best part of a decade, you know, doing his own thing, maybe even more before he got that supreme job it just came about at the wrong time he wasn't institutionalized he didn't believe in the myth of supreme or the myth of the industry that kind of been shattered to him um shattered for him he was best friends with virgil who was the antithesis of breaking um that sort of like um so, you know breaking that focus sort of um breaking that mindset um or that fucking yeah that mindset that everyone had where you sort of believed in the myths of the industry and the validation that they kind of needed or that you needed in order to feel somewhat accepted and to feel like you were valid and you had a place there and the you know and the insistence on wanting permission from people to do things that all went away so maybe the supreme job came for him at the wrong time maybe if he would have got the supreme job early on he probably would have been a bit more malleable he probably been a bit more open to um compromise but being your own boss for the best part of 10 plus years and then getting a job working for supreme who are in the vf corp era where they essentially have their own bosses they have to answer to it was never really going to work well so i just think that was by and by and large the main issues with it and i also think he probably went in there thinking hey this company is also edgy in its own way they will not have an issue with me being edgy in my way or being provocative with the stuff that i chose and what i think he realized quite quickly was that Supreme, like most streetwear brands out there, aren't really provocative. They aren't really political. They don't really have anything to say. They're just in the business of making clothes. And whatever makes clothes, um, and whatever, sorry, makes money, they will make. It's not really anything deeper than that. Maybe the brand owner, the founder might have a deeper message on his graphics or on the particular colors used or on the models or on the cut, whatever. There may be loads of coded messages, you know, in these clothing, like similar to flipping Demna. But the majority of people that wear Vetema, that wear Balenciaga, you know, they don't wear it because it's overtly political or because it says anything interesting or cool about the fashion industry, which it obviously does. And it's kind of poking fun at it. They wear it because it's cool that's it and i think he quickly realized that this company that he thought that stood for something doesn't really stand for anything apart from selling clothes which is nothing wrong with it because i'm not somebody that believes that fashion or streetwear should be political i personally think it should just be a platform to express ideas if they happen to be political fair play but you can't you shouldn't use fashion and streetwear as a vehicle to um, push a political agenda. Personally, in my opinion, I just think it's never going to end well for you because most people don't really care and you're going to end up kind of making yourself cry. But regardless, um, I feel like, he, you know, Tremaine defended himself well as best as he could. I fundamentally disagree with probably 90 percent of his stances and how he approaches things and it was only a little bit it was probably a little bit disappointing over time to see that he probably wasn't 
the guy in my head who he thought he was in terms of how he viewed himself, in terms of how he viewed the industry, in terms of how important fashion and design is, in terms of actually changing things in the real world. Um, you know, it's just a bit odd. But I did really admire one thing I really liked. I think I was doing, saw a gig with at myself with myself a little bit every time I watched it. There were parts in the interview where he almost sounded very yayish. I think that's what happens when you're around when you're around yay. He started listing off his own accolades, talking about the time that he worked at Yeezy, which was quite cool, how his time was split across working with the clothes and working with music, which was he was one of the only people that could do that. The close relationship with Yay, with Virgil, the stuff he did with Stussy being the artistic director over there, which I didn't know about. So he was really like basically letting these nuts hang and reminding people that he's a big deal and i like that about him i like that about the episode but it really was a reminder that you know sometimes in life it is really important to get a handle or to get an idea of what you're walking into before you walk into it because not all opportunities are what they seem to be you know the grass ain't always green on the other side and i think he soon quickly realized that you know even with that 600 grand a year you know salary the option to work for such a storied brand the, the the what it could add to his legacy what it could add to his cv the connections it could make all this sort of stuff in the end the things that really annoyed him were the fact that he wasn't being listened to he wasn't being seen he wasn't being acknowledged he wasn't being respected um and ultimately the dream that he had in his head of this brand that he always loved being a part of that entire supreme extended team since the late 90s didn't really lived up to his expectations so that could have probably been a real bummer so i'm going to play a couple of the clips for you here this one says tremaine was a former designer and creative director of supreme and he recently stepped down we talk about what happened so this is a clip taken from the Torre show instagram so you can hear what he had to say what did you foresee the supreme customer thinking and saying when presented with here's a hoodie here's a t and skateboards uh, and skateboards yeah with an image of a cuz what what do you, what do you what do you think is the end result there or the thought and the intention of the wearer i think it's the same thing they'd say when supreme released a t-shirt of two catholic nuns um one with a cross in her hand the other nun with her her ass out and a gag ball in her mouth or when they've released uh dash knows artwork of human se with his semen or on the cover of the New York Post of Saddam Hussein with glitter on it. If the customer is intelligent, yes. and if they've been following Supreme, Supreme puts out provocative art with artists. Yes. They just never do it with black artists. I love how he's equating provocative art with the depictions of black people with being lynched. You know what I mean? Like surely at your at your level, at your stage, in your position, you'd want that not to be just provocative art right you don't, you don't want that association at all but i think fundamentally what you see from here is just basically i think tremaine has this idea that humanity the black race the world overall will never move on until it makes peace of its past effectively it's what he's trying to basically say until we make peace of our past until we rid the world of racism we will never really move on i think that's just make the point of saying that actually he said that once you know there's no more racism in the world or there's no more police brutality he'll stop making anything you know that he basically already makes at the moment which is a weird really place to go because essentially it's him committing himself to a life um of like trauma porn designing which is an odd place to be at but i think that's where he fundamentally had a bit of a disconnect with supreme they don't see the world in that way they don't view it in that way they don't think um the ills of the world can be cured through a coach jacket through a t-shirt a hoodie and a skate deck comp an escape deck collection um they just see those as you know objects of maybe you can throw some art on it some art they are okay to put on it some not but i feel like they really did dodge a bullet supreme don't need that kind of smoke can you imagine how crazy people have, would have been on social media if they would have eventually put out those decks and those t-shirts with those images of people being lynched and being whipped and shit on skateboards and hoodies and whatever it may be can you imagine even some of Tremaine's friends who you know are incredibly um rah-rah political BLM people on social media if they had to be confronted with seeing some dorky looking white kid wearing these images of people who have been brutalized and in pain with people and imagine if Supreme didn't come out and say overtly that they were going to contribute any money to charity or funds and stuff how bad that would have went so i think you know it was a really smart this in in the short term it was bad because it made supreme look like a racist company because that's what he essentially says he comes to this interview and basically says you know supreme is you know what's it, what's it systemically racist um he even mentioned some names i think erin mcgee um from made me who's a bit of a streetwear legend if you know you know she comes out of this not looking the greatest basically tremaine without saying it 
clearly basically calls her a racist basically says she um is a an ally to um who's that guy that what um i forgot who the guy is um some designer who virgil was beefing with before he passed away um or the gazana was beefing with him actually because virgil because he thought virgil had copied some of his designs and um he basically says in a roundabout way that you know that thing was scrapped because um some people in the company weren't happy with how he spoke to virgil before obviously the denim tears uh, Tremaine Sawyer joined and then when he left he allegedly heard that Aaron McGee was trying to resurrect that collaboration which is in effect him saying without saying that you know she's endorsing this guy um and kind of you know vetoing and being okay with it and kind of excusing whatever she he might have said about Virgil in the past which is essentially saying that hey this woman is racist so he doesn't really st- you know, he doesn't really pull any punches. But I just feel like, unfortunately, the company that he went to wasn't about that fight. They didn't really want to fight that fight. They didn't care about it. It wasn't there. You know, it wasn't something that they really gave a fuck about. And maybe that was the most disappointing part for him when he was there. And then next video here, um, Tremaine breaks down the exact reason why he actually has Supreme. Here's the thing with Supreme. And this is where, this is, I didn't resign because of the age images i resigned because of their thoughtlessness and their lack of response when i was trying to garner discourse i said to them hey do you realize supreme rep- is the michael from macro of american society how so if you look at the supreme artist t-shirts where an artist takes a picture with wearing a supreme logo 80 percent of them are black when okay. you look at Supreme artist collaborations where they put an artist's art, a fine artist's art on a skateboard, they've done two black people in 30 years. They've done only a couple of women. Everything else is white, Man. as they say in woke terms, cis male artists. Yeah. So I said that replays out American society. We like Mike Tyson and Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan and LeBron James, but in James Baldwin and Arthur Jaffa... Mm, I don't know if we're going to let that creep into popular culture. I don't know about that. I think that's a really um, reductive way to look at it. And also, I don't think people can say James Baldwin isn't exactly contemporary. Um, there are many people who I know who are non-black who love James Baldwin. Um, to suggest that he's some, some he's he's on the same level of um, underground or unknown as Arthur J. For based on maybe how provocative and controversial his work is, is crazy. But hey, whatever. The maybe the takeaway from this again is just a lack of you know there just wasn't enough there wasn't enough synergy i guess between both of them even though it sounds like when he was hired supreme definitely had an idea of who he was like they headhunted him he mentions some guy called what's his name julian or something julian khan i think he used to work at nike actually yeah, i think it was julian he used to work at nike because i remember him from my time working at 1948 i remember people mentioning his name quite often and i think i may have seen him one time before he's i think he's french as well if i'm not mistaken anyway he mentions him and he mentions that guy calling him and basically saying hey we want to hire you so he never applied for the job so i can understand his frustration right he never even applied for the job he wasn't even thinking about it they headhunt him so he's with he kind of automatically thinks they know what he's about he tries to do what he's about at the brand and they say no or they don't even say no they just basically um give him a run around they're not clear with him um they make it seem like they're down you know there's a conversation he says he had with james jebbia where he was really down with it and he was giving this whole oh you know he was giving it the whole like um white guilt thing and about yeah i see my my kind of you know my blind spots and da 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 da. I didn't see my privilege before. All this nonsense talk he gives him, and unfortunately Tremaine was naive and didn't understand that he was just kind of you know paying him lip service. But his actions didn't speak up to what he said, and he obviously didn't follow through with the collaboration with Arthur Jaffa, which now we know his pronunciation is not Arthur Jaffa, it's Arthur Jaffa. And um, Tremaine did also make that very very clear in this clip, which is fucking hilarious. Um, but yeah, I just think there was a. Um, lack of synergy between them wasn't that big of a deal um i feel like it's unfortunate how it ended obviously and it's also been unfortunate as a fan of the brand to realize that you know the store isn't very reflective or the store the community um or the things that they push out isn't really reflective of how they are behind the scenes um he's he basically is saying that you know they're not run the same way that you think they're depicted in the stores and how cool and fun those places are 
um you know the content that you put out via the skate videos um just in general the vibe around them the people associated with the brand it just doesn't match up with how they are in the head office which is the only kind of concerning bit about it but i also think tremaine was in a perfect position i also think tremaine was in a perfect position to change that he could have easily changed that himself and um, being there. All those frustrations that he had with not being seen, with maybe not having enough black people there, with not maybe having enough people up from minorities, communities there. Um, he could have easily hired a few of those people while he was there and kind of changed things, but he didn't for whatever reason. And it kind of went south and, you know, it kind of is what it is. Um, it's just been unfortunate to see it all kind of play out because for the longest time, Supreme has been very secretive, very behind the scenes, kind of doing things quietly and to see what their business kind of being put out there has been a pretty weird to see to be honest because you know some of the names even associated with supreme you wouldn't know them unless you're balls deep with the brand or unless you speak to somebody that actually works there so to hear all these names associated with the brand the people who work there behind the scenes and to hear him speak so disparagingly about it it's just like damn man this brand that you loved probably isn't as great as you think it is on the inside which makes a lot of sense because i remember the time when i was working at nike and i had this you know i had this idea or this fatuation with working at nike i wanted to be the next you know nike energy marketing manager right and that was the main big job to have back in the day i think even heron preston had it before and a few other people too but it was one of the main cool jobs to have at nike because you were like going to fashion shows you could like see things to people you were in charge of doing cool marketing campaigns and activations with certain things and collaborations and bloody blah, blah blah you were just the kind of cool guy at nike um contact that they could kind of use and throw around and send different places and it just felt like a fun job to have and obviously with the free nike that you need in it so obviously amazing but then over time working again this is at a retail level at 1948 over at nike i quickly realized that maybe that company wasn't the greatest culturally um, it wasn't the greatest cultural match for me obviously i didn't help things because there were certain occasions where i was very obtuse i was very you know cocksure i kind of had a bit of that zoomers mentality in me where i felt entitled to big jobs even though i had no knowledge of what the job was i just had you know knowledge of the product and of the culture and i was tapped in i felt like yeah i knew more than anybody you know i, mean, I just had this really weird ego about me so i'm sure that didn't really lend itself well to a lot of people that worked in the head office and you know by the time it ended I was probably one of the first people after five or so years at that company who got let go after the reshuffle because another lady came in. Actually, I think it was Sharmadine, wasn't it? Yeah, Sharmadine actually came in to replace the person. Sharmadine um, from uh, Wire Nails, who now has gone on to do loads of other cool things. She came in as a new person to overtake that kind of role. And then she basically got her own people involved and she kind of sacked everybody, um, including me, unfortunately. Um um, and a few other people and then got her own people involved which is odd really because I think I might have been one of the only black people I don't know it doesn't matter anyway we continue so I got let go and a few other people got hired but some people stayed and I think I, that was the first time I realized ah oh, okay cool maybe I'm just not cut out for this like industry thing because clearly I didn't make a good enough impression to have kept my role in that place so I kind of knew and also I had people work I had people who I knew from the scene who made it there who kind of worked their way up and had good positions there and I realized comparing myself to them personality wise they had more capacity to do that kind of you know role and to be that person than I did they could just manage it a lot more better which is fine and I feel like maybe that was Tremaine's error he just assumed because he knew these people he could also work with them i think it's different when you work with them and again it also must be different having been an independent contractor an independent business owner for all those years and then suddenly having to go work in a corporation it's just difficult to handle and difficult to make right and like i said sometimes just working at these companies just isn't what you thought it was it's not doesn't mean it's bad or good it just isn't what it was and culturally i think he mentioned even himself like just the the culture in the office was a, was the thing that really didn't sit well with him being in the office full of just white people was hard to handle because it didn't maybe match his image of supreme and it's just something that he didn't know was as important as it was to him because he lives a life where he can basically hang out who he wants to hang out then you're going to work and you're with these people who work this job and they're all a particular way they all think a particular way or they look a particular way it could just be a bit unsettling so i just think unfortunately for him the cult culturally didn't match it was a good opportunity it didn't go the way it needed to go but i think in all it probably did bolster his profile it made him way more relevant than maybe he was before personally i think his brand has become what it's become but i feel like his brand was starting to maybe eclipse even him did him tears to become a little bit more popular than even Tremaine the person so the this whole controversy has propelled him back into the cultural conversation has reminded people what he's about what he stands for for better or worse and I think in the end it will end up doing him good so I don't think it's a bad thing but then I think this is an interesting comment 
and an interesting clip of Angela Back, who used to be the, if I'm not mistaken, was it the fashion director or the art? I forgot what the role was, but essentially it was the precursor to the creative director role that Tremaine had, where he was sort of the face of Supreme. And he had that role prior and he left to start his own brand called Awake, which it's kind of been a bit up and down. I feel like the recent lookbook that I've checked out recently kind of felt like it was very the hundreds coded. It's a bit, it felt a bit naff or whatever. I'm not really too sure. Maybe that's his taste of how he likes to do his clothes, but it just, it didn't feel like, it just felt a little bit uninspired personally for me. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, he sat down with Throwing Fits and had a very interesting perspective on the whole thing. And I felt like to me, this is everything that's probably wrong with the scene because Tremaine had to take all those bullets from people on social media calling him out myself included mocking him laughing at him for how his position on supreme and calling it systemically racist and all this malarkey but then I've had one person in my comments who said they worked for VF Corp and who have known people from supreme and said yes there are some issues at supreme in to do with racism and to do all those things so it's not like Tremaine is lying and also in this clip um Angela back confirms it but he never said this before so now all of a sudden, after many years of him leaving the company, much distance has gone, much time has gone by. A lot of distance has been made between him and Supreme. He's made his own name for himself, for his own brand. Tremaine had to take all the bullets himself or be mocked online, only for this guy to say much after the fact, once prompted, yes, Supreme has actually maybe gone a racism problem. Like these guys, man. Tremaine and your ex-employer Supreme, could you kind of understand where he was coming from as someone that used to work there as a POC? Working there was very challenging. As a POC. I was the only person of color that worked there in a position of power. So I understand Tremaine's frustrations. And if you really look at the blueprint of what I've been building post-Supreme, you understand what my experience was there. It's no coincidence that... And first of all, I fucking hate when people say awake and woke. Awake has nothing to do with being woke. <laughs> awake came about because I wanted to build something refined at first, right? I was changing and developing and my ideologies were different and also like my tastes were, were a little bit, bit more refined than what was happening at Supreme at that time. And then I'm like, I need to start creating a place, building a place that can actually be a platform of opportunity for kids that look like me. When change doesn't happen, something has to happen inevitably in order for there to be change. You know what I'm saying? So like me knowing the inner workings are there and me being close to Tremaine all these years is just like, Good luck. Did you advise him on taking that role? Like, did you talk about it beforehand? He just... No. I would have advised of the inner workings in order to be able to navigate that place to his advantage. I find that absolutely hilarious, right? And again, these guys act like they're all best friends and they're all this big click and shit, but you know, it's all just for Instagram. I guess we know that now, isn't it? Because if you knew someone was legitimately going to walk into a quote-unquote racist environment you'd go out of your way if you are that person who deems yourself to be woke who deems yourself to be progressive you would definitely make sure to make them aware of it before they go there you wouldn't just sit back and let them take the job and see how it goes but again these guys are all full of shit but it must be so disconcerting for fucking for fucking um what you got tremaine he took all those bullets he took all that hate online all that valid criticism some of it quite you know constructive some of it also quite abusive only to have somebody that worked there previously in a position of power say the same thing that he said in a roundabout way absolutely hilarious the only thing that's different i think with this is more so i feel like tremaine's issue is there's loads of them at once there's obviously the work culture there's obviously the systemic racism racism thing there's obviously him feeling like his position wasn't respected because he, he basically said that james jebbia is the creative director without a title He's still the one in charge. He still calls the shots, which to me is quite cool because it, it goes to show why the brand has still been survived. It's still been able to survive and thrive over the last 20 plus years because James Jebby is still at the helm. He's still leading it. We already see what happens with fucking um, with a negoless bape. It's absolutely horrendous, right? That brand is not even bape. It should just change its name to something else. But you will see how that goes wrong. So clearly that's been a part of its success, but obviously him working in that position for so long, it's going to be hard for him to kind of relinquish the power and the authority and the autonomy to somebody else, right? He's going to obviously try, it's going to be weird to kind of have somebody working alongside you or somebody that should be calling the shots when you maybe still feel like you should be doing it yourself. Um, so that was maybe the fucking interesting thing to hear about with this type of thing going on there, that clearly all these issues at Supreme were there from, for a while, but no one spoke about it because again the scene the people in it have this weird idea that you have to protect things and you can't talk about things out loud and i'm sure if you meet that met these guys in bars and pubs they will tell you and tell you to keep it to yourself but these are things that you'd think 
are important enough for the public to know are important enough for you to put out there to forewarn people especially if they want to work there or just to maybe change things in society to change things culturally in the kind of scene that we're in but they don't do it so this is to me i love another example of hashtag brave right you don't say anything until the coast is clear until it's safe for you to pop your head up and say something by that time it's too late and you know everybody's opinions kind of been set on it because essentially this guy is basically saying the same thing that um denim tears i uh, sorry that tremaine emery is was saying um but saying it in a much more palatable way so so in the end, it ended how it ended. I think everyone's going to land on their feet. You don't need to cry for anybody involved in this story because they're going to be perfectly fine because they're going to be perfectly fine. Moving on to another one of the Supreme alumni, there's this interesting collaboration between J. Crew and Union LA. And I feel like this is a perfect example as to why some of these companies want to tap into streetwear folk who are essentially running the culture because like Tremaine mentioned in that Supreme interview, part of a creative director's role isn't just designing, isn't just leading the team, isn't just brainstorming, isn't just, you know, ideating, isn't just whatever. It's mostly to do with your black book of contacts. And if you're somebody that works in streetwear who's had, you know, a, a storied legacy, a storied name, you've got connections and blah, 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 blah. There are certain people in your black book that these brands could just not get access to. And I know this because I've having worked in certain companies and certain startups where we've worked with certain people in streetwear. I know how important it was for me to be in the role that I was in. Like a lot of people I was able to get booked on that online streetwear course that I was doing that was led by Virgil, which is how I met him. A lot of the reason why I was able to get some of those people involved there was because I had a somewhat personal connection with the scene. And maybe they have heard of me in the past. They might have heard of my Stop Begging blog that I used to do back in the day. But a lot of that stuff that I thought was really nothing and a bit silly, maybe some of my life on the Crooked Tongues forum or just being a part of the quote unquote London sneakerhead scene, a lot of that went a long way to kind of allowing me to book certain people. But then in a certain way, I also saw the limits of my reach because certain people I just couldn't get access to because I didn't know who they were. So I'm sure when J. Crew hired Noah Bababtian, um, obviously the founder of Noah, part of the reason why they hired him was just for things like this, to get him to get him to maybe tap into his black book and maybe potentially get a collaboration with people like Union, who you'd assume the guy over Union, Chris Gibbs, is very selective and picky about who he works with because he's very aware of, you know, the clout and the cachet that he has with Union. But he's also super protective about it because the only reason that clout and cachet works is because he's very protective about it and he kind of guards it with his life. So the only way this collaboration could have happened is if Jacob hired Noah Bababjian and this is why, sorry, Brenda Bababjian and this is why these collaborations or these appointments happen more often than not because these black books are super handy especially if you're a j crew and you're trying to tap into the gen z millennial market those guys have got them by you know got these guys in the palm of their hands so it only makes sense to kind of get them on board so a collaboration here with union um we've got some knits we've got some nice jackets we've got some sunglasses we've got some t-shirts leather jackets woolly hats nice sweatshirts um we've got some nice um suits as well in this nice check pattern and maybe some shoes also a chore jacket combination some great things overall and let's just read the article about it here it says Chris gibbs and union um los angeles and j crew have led military to actually have joined forces the two designs longtime friends having first met in 1996 when gibbs began working part-time at supreme under babson's creative tenure see so yeah B B brenda babji was maybe the first creative director really if you think about it that we kind of knew of and then obviously he went off to do noah and he's actually doing noah at the same time he's at supreme then he stopped it then he left supreme and then restarted if i'm not mistaken he continued he said it just made sense chris is one of my close oldest friends and was also one of the people i call when i need advice he's as genuine as he's come as they come and i'm thrilled to have this opportunity to work with him a true individual which is great i think that's also something that goes to show that what i love about streetwear you could be long time friends with somebody and you could be put in a position of power and then you could also be in a position to put some money in your pockets, put some money in the pockets of your close friend. So you've been working in this industry for a while, you've done a great, amazing things together and you get a position where you could essentially hire them to do this amazing role and you could get them, you know, get, get them to put some money in your pockets, expand their fucking portfolio, put their name out there again and just be, you know, a good mate. I really like that kind of side about it where you can kind of give back to people who maybe helped you in the past in a big way like this um, by giving these super commercial collaborations. The collection shapes up, because this might be the most, is this might be the most commercial thing they've done outside of a Nike? Union, I'm not too sure, but this is really up there. So big up them. The collection shakes up 
um, a top shelf cocktail of J. Crew Classics, Americana Ethos, um, Union's archetype of streetwear, offering J. Crew signature, a new lease of life. The joint offerings Gibbs um, transforms the heritage brand's timeless silhouettes. Uh, okay, so many words there for nothing. It says, yeah, I didn't want to put graphics on everything. That's never been my big thing, says Gibbs. I decided to set to play with proportions, drape and color through the lens of streetwear and high fashion. Gibbs and Babington put forth a knit program, paying homage to J. Crew's pow prowess in the genre and asymmetrical shapes de demand uh, made in distress up at alpaca fleece textiles plaid fabrics drop their buttoned up personas for something more playful while a number of graphic tees and sweats adopt a collaborative um gibbs and, sorry gibbs and babian put forth a knit program paying homage to j crew's prowess in the genre with asymmetrical shapes made with a distressed alpaca fleece textiles the, co the collection's hero however is the herringbone twill fabric which was made to look like denim in a note of the work where impact on the designers the material which gibbs said he discovered while vintage shopping in japan forms the lines of the chore jacket and pants set as well as the cap i am really proud of what we built it's subtle by nature we try to make everything that could live organically in both um, j crew's doors and union's doors i think we did that the union and los angeles j crew collection is now available to shop in the union um la tokyo osaka and j crew bowery and online at both their web stores take a closer look available now so as you can see here you got the chore jackets you got the set which i like you've got the nice crew you've got this amazing knit and this jacket as well that this girl was wearing on the left hand side which might be my favorite it's a really nice jacket i wonder what the price is on this this bad boy let's actually see if we can go in union la oh wow the prices are really good actually aren't they the chore jacket is 298 the pants are 280 so you're essentially paying what 500 dollars for the top and the bottom which i think is pretty good because the quality on this is going to be really well really high i think they're going to look amazing too once they're worn in a little bit i like the look of those um the pajama set thing is 133 138 dollars for the top 128 for the pants the rugby polo jersey is really nice as well there's also a hat that goes with it. I don't see the leather jacket though, unfortunately. I don't see that leather. Maybe that leather is only available on, what you call it? Oh, that peanut in awake stuff is really nice actually. Uh, maybe that leather jacket is only available on the JQ website. But so far, I'm not really mad at the pieces. I think they look really, really tasty to be fair. I'd wear the fuck out of all of this stuff. It's really, really good looking. So big up on them to putting a collaboration together. Again, another reminder, if ever you needed it, why some of these companies go out their way to tap into some of these streetwear folks because they have the culture in the palm of their hands they have the great black book and they could also you know essentially tap into some of it their history with their fans or with their people that they've worked with and be able to put these collections together in more ways than other people could so big up j crew big up union can't wait to see more from them going forward can't wait to see more from them going forward Moving on from that one, we have this really interesting and great news to play here or to talk about here on the pod regarding Michael Bibby, head of Solo, um, Solid Grooves, um, who made a triumphant comeback at Ibiza for the closing party over there. And he played a surprise set. Um, as most of you know, he's currently in recovery or treatment, sorry, for cancer. Um, I think it says here, he is after 100, more than 100 days of cancer treatment. Um, he's now, I guess, on the other side of it and starting to get back a little bit healthy. And he decided to pop out and play a surprise set um during the solid grooves closing party during ibifa and it must have been an absolutely crazy time to be there considering what he's basically been going through and it was kind of great to actually see him have a smile on his face again tweeting out stuff like one life live it and obviously putting out these amazing pictures of him behind the booth looking absolutely happy as larry to be playing again and having the fucking hat that says fuck cancer on it all that's sort of good stuff but it made me kind of question and think about to myself like what would i have done in that similar situation touch word it never happens to me anytime soon but i was thinking to myself if i ever got diagnosed with something like this and i was in recovery and whatever it may be would the first thing i'll be thinking about going out and getting on it would i want to go and do a pirate session or something or whatever it may be and i don't think it would be i think the main thing that i'd probably want to do would be to go and maybe experience something maybe go to a you know um maybe go on a holiday somewhere maybe gonna go to a really nice park that i like maybe go hiking somewhere i don't know something that would maybe even just go to a concert and see other people having fun because i usually get a lot of um good feeling around that sometimes just being around people actually excited for life and shit would make me feel somewhat um um appreciative of the life i actually lived but i don't know if the first thing i'd want to do is go to a nightclub i'm not too sure but it also shows the importance or how much that whole life and that career meant means and 
meant and still means to Michael Bibby in that that was the first place he went to go to to somewhat feel human to be connected again with people to be appreciative of still being here and being able to maybe have a smile on his face have a good attitude behind it because that's something that's been quite admirable to see about him on social I'm sure privately he has these really tough and difficult times but I like how positive and fun and appreciative he is on social regardless of how terrible your situation is he's really really trying to be um positive about it and have a good perspective about it um regardless of what's going on with him privately and i think that's very admirable considering just how heady he was at one point to come to this low low and to still be as high as he is now still got a smile on his face is something to be definitely acknowledged and something to be definitely clapped about and celebrated and i can only imagine how happy that guy must have been to be behind the booth once again um amongst the people that he knows amongst the scene that he fucking loves playing the music that he fucking adores for a horde of people who had no idea he was going to be there that must have been fucking great and i've actually got a clip here taken from all the clips on his instagram of him actually playing for the first time um since his um cancer treatment for a crowd of people that are super super happy to see him so let's play that the only thing that made me laugh about this though slightly was that really like <laughs> you know leaving your cancer treatment to go back to fucking ib for just to go play tech house is a definitely a decision you know that's definitely one thing to do if anything if you're gonna go there you should be like you know what i'm determined to change everything about what people think i am and what i do i'm gonna play a different two completely different sound but man just went out there and just played the same old tech house he was playing before <laughs> like nothing actually changed and everybody absolutely lapped it up i love it Good vibes, though, man. Look at how happy everybody looks in the crowd. People are ecstatic, jumping around in the booth, hugging him. The phone's out, him smiling. I love seeing him. Top boy. Everyone's so happy to be there. Fair play. Look at the crowd. Look how many people are there. Look at the phones in the air. Look at that. Phone documenting the occasion for once. I don't really mind that shit. Everybody going hammer the drop. Fair play. But yeah, anyways, um, you know what, go on, you know the deal. You know, you see him happy, you see him jubilating and having a good time over there. So big up him. And hopefully he does make a steep speedy recovery and is able to come back at full force and back in the scene and do something smashing again. The only thing that really was interesting to me was reading some things online about how different people react to terminal illnesses. And some people, you know, use it as an opportunity to change everything about them. And some people just go the complete opposite way and become extremely destructive. Start drinking low, start doing more drugs as before, which is something that happens quite often that you don't really think about a lot because, you know, maybe if it doesn't happen to you directly, you probably don't really pay it to mind. But I was watching a lot of stuff online, reading a lot of stuff online also about it. And it's something that happens quite often. People like legitimately in treatment would just be like, fuck it, I'm not going to go through with all this chemo. It's fucking me up it's making me down it's destroying me on the inside it's painful i'm just gonna enjoy the time i have and do what the fuck i want the, you know racking up lines drinking a bunch taking pills and just doing you know what you deem to be destructive like destructive to their life because they don't want to fight they can't fight right they don't have it in them to fight anymore because it's just taking out it's taking more out of them than just accepting uh, the time they have available and just making the best out of it in the way that they think is the best out of it so it's a very different different reflection on those type of things so i do give um people credit um or i do understand both sides of it i don't judge any of it i don't judge the ability to go back you know like i said the first thing i wouldn't have done is go back to a rave personally but then also you know this is not my career right this is his livelihood this is his entire life before this unfortunate diagnosis and the first thing that you want when you're probably in that position who cooped up in hospitals and whatever on your own alone is just to be around people again right just to kind of feel quote unquote normal again and i feel that it's the best way to do it for him so big up michael bibby um hopefully he makes a speedy recovery and we see him back in full force on the dance floor very 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 soon and then of course i thought i would end it with news about man united because why not right why not talk about man united so united lost one nil at home against crystal palace um the second time we played crystal palace in effectively a week after the carling cup or the league cup match i would have said that most likely 
United had to win both games. That's the level, or that's the level that we're at at the moment. We can't afford to lose any game, especially not against Crystal Palace. And I feel like because how terrible our league form has been, and because of all the issues around the protracted sale, the horrible transfers, our horrible owners, you know, indecision, you know, around the manager, people not liking the players anymore. I just feel like we had to win both games back to back to have any chance of staving off some of the negative criticism that would have come if we did lose or draw. And unfortunately, with this United team, they always let you down. And, you know, the manager maybe let us down as well because I thought the lineup against Crystal Palace um, kind of showed what we can do as a team if we change some of the people that we are re overly reliant on um, to get us a result in the starting lineup that might actually help. Um, obviously, Eric Ten Hag did what he's always going to do and reverts back to what he thinks his best players are, played them and effectively got punished for it because that performance by and large, especially from some of our most experienced players on the pitch, was nothing short of diabolical. Like really, really was diabolical to see um, just the lack of effort some of our players were putting in, um, the lack of cohesion in the team, the lack of fight, the lack of chance creation. I feel like a lot of the players there weren't really, they didn't really offer much going forward. Um, I feel like even if we would have played for another two days, we probably wouldn't have scored a goal. Um, and we looked blunt. We looked really ineffective. And it's getting so bad now at the moment that we have people legitimately questioning Rasmus Hoyland and saying that or Hoyland sorry and questioning whether or not he's good enough to play as a central striker for United and I feel like that goes back to the conversation around Martial I think some of the people especially the Martial fanboys the things that they would argue about when it comes to Martial was yes he has these shortcomings but playing up front for United is a very thankless task especially when you have players like Rashford and Bruno you know playing with you and stuff who usually want to be the main guys in the team and you don't have a team that actually creates a lot of things you are really dependent and sometimes feeding on scraps so sometimes when our striker for United doesn't play well it's really hard to judge them objectively because the team doesn't play well. So the strikers usually, I feel like, depend a lot on the team playing well, unless you want a striker that's going to be able to drop in the midfield, pick up the ball for themselves, you know, thread themselves through and then latch onto the ball. It's not going to happen. So that's how bad we're getting as a team now, where Hoyland, as a striker that came in with no real expectation, someone could come and take a chance on and hope it could work over the season is now being judged quite, you know, harshly over a short number of games, even though the team's playing at its worst. And I feel like to me, not necessarily much of the game, I feel like the Crystal Palace goal was fucking fantastic. Um, that Joachim, or what's his name? Is it Joachim? I think Joachim Anderson, dude, the centre-back for Crystal Palace is definitely one of the best centre-backs in the league. I've always rated him anyway. I feel like his, um, his ability to play out from the back with the ball at his feet is very underrated. His passing is phenomenal. Um, the half volley in our box um, was really great, especially when you think that he had to kind of run back towards the ball to kind of hit it on the vast folly absolutely brilliant finish so he's definitely somebody i've always rated so big up Joachim Manderson. i'm sure that'll definitely add a couple of millions to his value when he does eventually end up leaving crystal palace because he's definitely too good for to play for that team but i feel like apart from that they defended pretty well we didn't really trouble them as much and i feel like until garnacho came on um that's probably where we saw a bit of change and impetus on that on our left hand side their right hand side when they ended up playing my main thing with this coming away from this game because i'm not going to analyze the game because no point but my main feeling to coming from this is I feel like, unfortunately, Eric Ten Hag is putting himself in a position where he is slowly but surely going to get himself fired if he doesn't work out a solution for this team. At the moment, I feel like we're in such a bad run of form. Some of our better players in Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford are playing so badly right now, and I've been playing badly for a while, that he needs to seriously consider sometimes playing players who on paper aren't as good as them but maybe fit our team better because we saw what happened before in the week in the Carling Cup. We saw what happened in the Carling Cup because when Hannibal played, no one's going to sit here with, you know, with a straight face and say Hannibal's better than Christian Eriksen or Bruno Fernandes. But he obviously fit better with that team with the way that we were trying to play. He did a role. He played his role very, very well. And I feel like United are in such a, you know, bad run of form where it's such a hodgepodge of different players from different reigns of managers that you just need to figure out what combination of players will get you the best performances and results and then along the way you can start to tweak things but I feel like at the moment he's just trying to 
get there with just playing the best players and I feel like our best players are the ones that are usually letting us down the most. The Bruno Fernandes and the Marcus Rashford being the biggest example of it and I feel like that kind of partly explains why he's having such an issue with team discipline or morale or the whole Sancho thing because it wouldn't surprise me if someone like a Sancho as wrong as he is to not apologize because I feel like at this point just apologize for the sake of your career just to get playing football again so that you can force this move in January because if you're not playing I don't see who you're going to go to if you don't have a body of work to show that you can be an option for people it doesn't make any sense really so even to be self-serving and to be somewhat selfish look out for himself he should just apologize just so he can play football to get his eventual move in January but I feel like one of the reasons why someone like a Sancho refuses to apologize is because of what we're seeing now we see with some players in our team specifically Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford it doesn't matter how badly they play because they have moments of magic of inspiration where they can change the game for us at a moment on a moment's notice they always kind of get away with bad performances and they're allowed to just see out games they're allowed to stay on for long periods of the game they don't ever get dropped or because they happen to be our quote-unquote best players because of their stats or because they are the best players who knows but I just feel like they are also detrimental to our team because when they're not playing well it's like playing with 10 men when Rashford's not tracking back when Rashford's not flipping pressing defenders when he's just not being part of the team and just waiting for the ball to get to him before he starts running we might as well not have anybody else on the pitch we might as well be down to 10 men because he's not going to be useful for us and when he's not on a good run of form and nothing's falling for him he's also not good for us so I personally would prefer us to be a team that could basically be more a team than a collection of individuals which we are at the moment and until Eric Ten Hag sorts that out he is going to be on a hide into nothing. And what we've seen with this group of players before, they normally always will opt for self-preservation over stepping up and owning their own mistakes. So if this continues, the players will down tools and eventually it'll be, he'll be in a position where Ten Hag will get sacked, which I don't want to happen because what will happen, that'll take away the onus or the attention from the owners who need to go. If we had serious owners in place, we would be in a far better position now because maybe the player acquisition the sales would have gone by way smoothly than it had been in the past because it's no secret that you know Eric Ten Hag wanted to get rid of a huge number of players in his team and that would have definitely changed the profile the personality and the whole vibe of the team and made it more his he hasn't had the opportunity to do so because the Glazers run the way the club the way they want to do it he didn't get a signing he wants either so he has to make do with what he has but I feel like now he needs to flip and figure it out because if not he won't see out January, really won't see out January. Um, he might be sacked before then because these results and these performances are so bad. And you think about it in contrast to the Liverpool game against Spurs, they were down to 10 men and they were playing better than us. They were creating more chances with nine men than we did with 11. They look more like a team with nine men than we did with 11. And it's utterly embarrassing that that happens. And clearly it's an issue with the players because these players have been here um, for a long time. They keep kind of seeing out managers and they never get sold and they keep getting offered new contracts. All this fucking malarkey happens. And I want us to get to a place where we just move on from a whole bunch of these players, even some of my favourites. But Ericsson Hark needs to buy himself time. At top clubs, you don't just get time for the sake of getting time. You earn it game by game, um, competition by competition, performance by performance. And so far, he's not earning any of that shit. So that's the only really scary part of it if you're a United fan is that likely he'll get sacked. He's going to get sacked and then we're going to start the same cycle all over again. And it's going to be fans out there thinking that we're going to get a new manager bounce and that's going to sort everything out. And I don't think that's the case. I feel like we're so broken as a club now that you need a fundamental change in culture, in ownership to change anything. It's not going to change any other way and I've said it from day dot I've always said that unless we get a Sir Alex Ferguson region or we get new owners we are never going to win a major trophy ever again I think it's been I've been proven right so far since Saf retired what have we won in terms of major trophies um, an FA Cup with Louis van Gaal a Europa League and what a Carlin Cup a League Cup sorry I don't think those are major trophies apart from the FA Cup, personally. And again, they weren't consistent over a consistent period of time. They're all kind of over different spots and spurts and bursts or whatever it may be with different managers. So clearly there is an issue there. And of course, we have the other issue of all the other teams in and around us also making moves. So we can't, you know, afford to be stagnant any longer because other teams outside of the top four are starting to make moves and the gaps are starting to become wider and wider and wider in terms of the quality on the pitch, the organisation behind the pitch and all this malarkey. So we need that ownership change more than anything. 
But until that happens, Eric Ten Hag needs to figure out the right combination of players to do what needs to be done for him on the pitch. And sometimes you have to decide that it's not just the best players that can do that for you. And I don't know why he's so incapable of doing that. I'm not sure why that is the case. And, you know, it's no surprise that some of these other players who are sitting on the bench don't feel like they get trusted because they don't. They don't really get trusted to do, um, to kind of slot in for other players. The other players get away with absolute murder. And I'm sure that creates a weird atmosphere in the change room because everybody knows that there are clear and obvious favourites and it's just too much. Maybe having one favourite is one thing, but two or three is just too much of a joke for me personally. But again, what do I know? What do I know? Anyway, that has been the Excellent Zing Show, episode number 710. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time, check out the show. You know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If it's your first time listening to this video audio podcast, you will hear my tune of the day. So please enjoy that. The tune of the day title can be found in the description, as can my social media links and all that malarkey. And also my Patreon to find my bonus episode of the Patreon show. That's available on there too. And I'll see all of you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe, everybody. Peace.